María de Sanz. Pero te vas a poner el microfono. ¿no? Después lo coloco ahí. Yo te voy a hacer así y me vuelves más lento. Y así, más lento y te vas a hacer más, más fuerte. ¿no? <risa> Ah, bueno, que vamos a anotar, voy a anotarte. Ok, ahora estamos live, pero vamos a, a pausar un poquito para dejar personas a entrar um, unos minutos. Un minuto. Sí, tranquilo. Voy a sentar la punta, la siguiente, vamos a caerme. La Sí, que está fuerte, que no se repita la misma parte, que no va a ser todo. ¿Para allá? 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 Ok, ahora sí. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this month's Venezuela webinar. Uh, my name is Elaine Spivak Rodriguez with the Alliance for Global Justice. Um, this month we have with us uh, three women from Grupo Sures in Venezuela. Um, I will introduce them in a moment. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about Zoom. This is our first webinar in this platform. So um, I think that I will ha I have it down, but uh, I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, you have the Q&A box. Uh, for those of you connected via computer, you have the, the Q&A box down. You'll see the little icon down in the middle of the, your screen. You can submit your questions throughout their presentation. They're going to speak for about 35 minutes um, and stop at uh, to give us 20 minutes at the end for, for Q&A. So please submit your questions as they come up, and then we can have some to work with. Um, we have uh, Maria. We have Maria Guerra with us, and. She is going to be translating, or she's going to be doing the presentation um, in English. And then we have Aura Rosa Hernandez and Maria Lucrecia Hernandez um, that are going to be doing the Q&A. So that's a little bit about how to work. Um, I just, uh, so this, this month we're going to be, um, so this is going to be giving us a presentation about the 30-page uh, study they just released um, over the summer about how unilateral coercive measures uh, deprive the population of basic products which are important for everyday life. So they will be sharing their findings from the study and provide some rec recommendations for their perspective, from their perspective as Venezuelans. Uh, human rights organizations. So um, I will introduce uh, Maria, just give you a little bit of information about Maria, um, who is in the middle. <laughs> um, she is a, she's the director of SUDES. She's a lawyer and graduate from the University of Buenos Aires with a master's degree in human rights, criminal and procedural law from the University of Barcelona. She has been a consultant for UNICEF and the United Nations Development Program. She has uh, been vice chancellor for the, the, Nas the National Experimental Security University and is currently the director of SUDIS. So welcome. And we also have with us Aura Rosa Hernandez. She is a political scientist. Uh, she got her degree from Central University of Venezuela. She received a master's degree in constitutional law from the University of Valencia and a master's degree in political science from Simón Bolívar University in Venezuela. She has been a consultant on women's rights for the Venezuelan government and is currently the training coordinator for SUDES. So welcome and take it away. Hello, do you hear us? Do you hear as well? Yes, sounds perfect. Okay, um, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And we're going to start by the presentation of our special report 
uh, by SURES. Uh, SURES is an organization focusing on human rights and also the study of uh, situations in Venezuela uh, regarding human rights. And it also has involved uh, with several organizations uh, of human rights and in Venezuela and also other parts and of Latin America and abroad. So um, we're going to start by 2014, which is the year where our country, Venezuela, has been subjected to a series of sanctions unilaterally imposed by several countries of North America and Europe. Uh, these sanctions have generated a rather serious impact on the enjoyment and exercise of human rights of its population. For our organization's special report, uh, I study on these coercive measures and their effects uh, that it has on the people is the one that we present. For this purpose of this uh, investigation, we made a chronological detail of these imposed sanctions, uh, their legal basis, and the scope and the relation with the public international law and the human rights law is presented as well. It's essential to underline that all the actions from the, those states that have imposed sanctions have started and revolved around the approval of a public law in the Congress of the United States of America in December 2014 during the administration of Barack Obama. Uh, the 113-2078 Act titled Public Law for the Defense of Human Rights and Civil Society is important to notice that this legal instrument is one that dictates the course of action for the policy of the government of the United States of America towards Venezuela, and then also mark the roadmap so other states under their influence have adopted recent, uh, in its recent years uh, a series of unilateral coercive measures against the country. This document includes a lot of sanctions aimed at financial, uh, financial and economic blockade of Venezuela, but it also provides a legal framework for member states of the Organization of American States and also the European Union, Union to ensure the interference in the internal affairs of Venezuela. So it's a law that explicitly and expressly recognizes that it contravenes the fundamental principles of public international law, as well as the Charter of the United Nations and the Charter of the Organization of American States. From SURES of organization, we believe that we should talk about unilateral coercive measures, MCU from now on, and not just sanctions, because if we use the term sanctions, it will imply that there is a legal there's a legally reprehensive act against a state that results in the application of a punishment there is. And an administration or criminal, san criminal sanction. From this perspective, we believe that in the case of Venezuela, there is no breach of a duty or rule by the state, but that this measure happened as a result of unilateral acts of states that oppose the government and that do not agree with their social and political orientation. And of course, they have a particular interest in a change of government in the country. Uh, up to date of the preparation of this report, which has been updated since, ever since July, um, 26 instrument had in, legal instruments have been issued that impose unilateral coercive measures against the country from December 2014 until May 2008. And this, that was the time of the, the report was published, but now is that sanctions are still to this day. Even today, we have more sanctions issued today. 54% uh, uh, of the sanctions have been imposed by the um, American government, totaling 15 sanctions. And in second place comes the European Union, who has applied four sanctions. And in a 14% goes countries like Panama, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the Helvetic Confederation, we have, which have imposed two measures each. 
it is important to emphasize that these sanctions are always preceded or are going or are going in parallel with official public statements of different uh, spokespersons of these states um, talking about the situation and the internal affairs of Venezuela. Some of them uh, that we uh, explain in length in our study. These sanctions against Venezuela come mainly from countries from the north, which historically have maintained relations of dom domination, colonialism, and spoliation over the countries of the south. Thus, their acting must necessarily be analyzed from the perspective and con on context of the conflict north and south, as well as the struggles of the people for their emancipation and liberation facing all forms of imperialism. In this regard, it should be noted, with the exception of Panama, that no other country in the American region or other continents have implemented unilateral coercive measures against Venezuela. Even other states whose government maintain a particular critical positions regarding the Venezuela government, they have preferred to address the differences in multilateral multilateral venues, like we saw today, but for actions within the framework of public international law before adopting unilateral sanctions. As mentioned, the normative milestone that marks the beginning of the implementation of these coercive measures against Venezuela is the 113-2078 Act published on December 18 and by the US Congress in 2014. This act aims and it justifies the unilateral sanctions and establish a base on the value of a judgment that this parliament makes about the Venezuelan economic situation, particularly the access to food and commodities and also human rights. In order to address these situations, and pretend to resolve them, they strictly ban American citizens and other people living in the US territory, like private companies, civil society organizations, charity institutions, among others, from carrying on any transaction or business with any person of any institution of the Venezuelan state, while they also impose comprehensive sanctions to whoever who dare to do so. That is how it established especially an economic, financial, and trade blockade against Venezuela, quite similar to the one imposed by the Cuban people during decades. This law in particular is also very similar to the promotion of the helms burton Act. So it's a complex of coercive measures similar to the Cuban republics to those uh, imposed to Cuba. Such measures have been widely rejected by the General Assembly of the United Nations, among other organizations, because it's serious violations of human rights that are as results from these actions. In addition, the law established sanctions that go specifically to the Central Bank of Venezuela, or highest authority in the monetary policy of the state. It also it sanctions Petroleos of Venezuela PDVSA, the main state company that has the monopoly of hydro, uh, hydrocarbon exfoliation of the nations, and that also generates the 90% of the income in foreign currency for Venezuela. Uh, other entities of state that regard uh, monetary, financial, and exchange control policy are also sanctions in that act. Finally, in order to restrain that blockade against Venezuela, that, lay, that law, uh, it also applies the possibility, invites the possibility to apply unilateral sanctions and freezing assets, funds, Venezuelan goods and properties, suspension of income, revocation of visas, and other documentations to the officials who hold public offices, military officers, and diplomatic representatives. It's about complementary measures that address and implement and strain the economy, 
the economic, financial and commercial embargo on Venezuela, as well as to impede the participation of the representatives of the states in international relations. As it will be described now on the basis of the assumption of this law, the other actions and coercive measures were funded were funded during the Barack Obama administration, but it had been carried out during the Donald Trump's administration as well. A few months asked after the adoption of the law 113, 2078, in March 2014, the former president of the US, Barack Obama, in consultation with the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States declares the Venezuela through an executive order. It declares an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States, paving the way for an eventual military aggression against our country and warning the world about his disposition of exercising military power to defend the, his interests. Such executive order additionally includes the prohibition to entry, a stay, and stay in the U.S. territory to a group of people who perform high-level public functions for the Venezuelan states, even imposing measures against the most elementary principles and current regulations with regards to public international law. In 2016, no sanction was imposed against the, the Venezuela government by the US. That year was a, a period in which these actions were focused on the application of the law uh, 113-2078, while public statements of the US government against uh, our country were increasingly offensive. Now in 2017, a new escalation of interference actions in Venezuela's internal affairs were, were intensified. That year alone, the US Office of Foreign Assets, Assets Control, issued six sanctions since February to November of 2016. In August 2017, uh, President Donald Trump decreased a new executive order in which Venezuela is military threatened once again by declaring it again as an unusual and extraordinary threat. These sanctions, together with other measures imposed by the, the Treasury Department, were aimed specifically at rejecting, ignoring, and banning the election, installation, and build of the National Constituent Assembly. Subsequently, more sanctions against Venezuela from November 2017 January and March were imposed up to date. One of the most significant uh, sanctions is the one decreed by President Trump on March uh, 19 of this year, in which he bans any transaction through the use of, digi of the digital cryptocurrency called Petro, which was created by the Venezuelan state in order to overcome the economic crisis originated from low oil prices as well as the economic, financial, and commercial blockade imposed by the United States of America and its allies during these last three years. In May, they imposed two new unilateral coercive measures. The first one was issued on May 18, in which the U.S. Office of Foreign Assets uh, punished some state officials and private entities and also punishing the transactions of United States citizens with persons of entities um, that we will mention later. The second measure is this executive order issued on May, uh, May 21 of this year which bans the following activities, such as transactions, financials, and other negotiations in relation or possession of any debt with the Venezuelan government, and the selling, transfer, cession, and declaration of guarantees by the Venezuelan government, including our old company, Petroleum of Venezuela, and the Venezuelan Central Bank. In any shareholder in which the Venezuelan government has any shareholder, of 50% of more. 
The Canadian government has also supported the US in the application of uni uh, these coercive measures, as well as the acts of interference in, his, in our internal affairs. To date, uh, two general sanctions have been issued and imposed by this country. The first one is called Regulation of Special Economic Measures, which combines economic measures against the, the Republic and also individuals whom the Canadian government considers that is responsible for the situation in our country. These regulations are the total expressions of alliance between Canada and the United States against Venezuela as of September 5, 2017. These sets of sanctions and regulations are in general aspects just juridical norms that reflect more or less what uh, the US already previously imposed, which includes bans and restrictions in matters of transactions and financial services. Also in September 2017, a law of special economic measures was issued and where 40 people that hold high positions in the Venezuelan government had been subjected to special measures and they tried to generate blockade and hinder the international relations of our country. Within the frame of the mentioned uh, association between the US and Canada, there have been a series of statements in support of the sanctions of the American government and against the Venezuela government by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, Christian Freeland. These statements have been mostly about the situation in Venezuela and they have denounced the actions of the Venezuelan state. What they called for the National Constituent Assembly and its following statement, establishment in August 2017. In the last month, there have been a series of statements requesting presidential elections, which is the result of an agreement of political coexistence policy that it was uh, agreed between the political parties of, op of the opposition of Venezuela and the Venezuelan government in Santo Domingo. This situation can be considered as an inter interference in the internal affairs of a country which is especially serious against the rights of the people and independence, sovereignty and free will. On the other hand, the European Union, the European Union has established a set of sanctions as of November 2017, in perfect cooperation and following the guidance from the US government. Since November 13, 2017, in 2017, the Council of Foreign Affairs from the European Union arranged a decision about the Venezuela situation and established many restrictions or exportation, trade, provision, and transfer to a country in terms of armament and related materials, including weapons, munition, vehicles, and military equipment, and as well as spare parts. At the same time, the alleged responsible for the situation of our country by the, the European Union, they were banned to enter the, their territory. Furthermore, the same agency issues the regulation 2017-2063 to the application of sanctions on the part of the member states from the European Union. And it's about an intended decision explicitly to decrease defense capacities that to decrease the defense capacities of our national uh, armed force and the, uh, the security citizen departments and who they think they are related or subordinated to execute requests issued by Barack Obama and Donald Trump in which Venezuela is declared uh, an unusual and extraordinary threat. And, and this is, is being seen as a military objective. It is also noted that the United Kingdom on November 15 of 2017, they established the same sanctions imposed by the European Union regarding the armament put, uh, prohibition and 
those regulations on the application of sanctions to entities, companies, and Venezuelan officials. In January of this year, the European Union penalized the maximum authorities from several agencies and entities from the Venezuelan state, including many, many people elected by popular election, among others from the National Election Council, the Supreme Court of Justice, the Prosecutor General of the country, as well as Citizen Security Department and the People's Power Ministry for Internal Affairs and Justice. These measures imposed um, also by the Swiss Confederation on March of this year are, were more of the recent action and the European part uh, against Venezuela. This sanction emulates the first from the European Union in respect of any transaction that involves the acquisition of trade of military armament, as well as technology equipment and aim it at the surveillance of telecommunication and internet by the country. It also includes the freezing of assets and economic resources. The logging, transit, and state on Swiss territory were forbidden and for seven officials of the Venezuelan uh, government as well. The, in the impacts of these measures on the human rights of the people in Venezuela can be resumed that in the international community recognize that the unilateral coercive measures are economic and political actions, though it might involve other fields, but that these are imposed by state or groups of states to coerce and subordinate the exercise of the sovereign rights from other states and provoke any change in this political field. Moreover, he also recognized that unilateral coercive measures, besides the fact that they hinder the performance of public representatives of the state, they also deprive the population of basic products, which are important for the country, such as staple foods and medicines. Therefore, the international community considers that all unilateral coercive measures against the state is a threat of, uh, and violate the human rights of those who live within its territory. For the year 2015, according to the information published by most, one of the most private uh, university education and uh, research setting, uh, center in the US, the main country from which uh, Venezuela imports goods and services are the, American, the United States of North America with $8 billion, Canada with $496 million. The main products and goods imported from Venezuela from the U.S. are medicines, medical instruments, other pedic appliances, corn, wheat, soybean flour, refined oil products, chemical, chemical products, among others. In this sense, we explain uh, more in our report that in, our, in the same year, 2015, the amount of imports of pack medicines from the US was 70, uh, 77 million. 54.5 uh, uh, million were used for medical and chirurgical instruments. Moreover, it's uh, very important to highlight that the material and consumables for X-ray equipment are also important from the US. With regard to food, corn, wheat, rice, uh, soybean flour, they will reach uh, an amount of 224 million in the case of soybean flour. And also in the same year, 72% of the products imported from Canada are wheat, which represent 366 uh, million. 50% of, of what is imported from Switzerland are also packaged uh, medicines that represents uh, 113 million. And 9.6% corresponding to human or animal uh, blood, as well as non-packaged drugs, antibiotics, and laboratory regions. 
it's also important to highlight that most of the medicines that it require that the country uh, requires to guarantee the life or and health of its uh, inhabitants, 34 percent is is purchased from the U.S., seven percent from Spain, and five percent from Italy. One only one of these countries that have implied unilateral coercive measures against Venezuela were imported a total of 46% of the medicines needed by the Venezuelan people. Next. The same thing happens with food. 33% of the imports come from the US and 12% from Canada. That is 45% of foods imports uh, that come from those states have maintained a policy of graded confrontation and have applied the greatest amount of economic sanctions against Venezuela. As a result, uh, this economic and financial, financial and commercial blockade imposed by the United States against Venezuela generates a large impact on the economy of our country and its social development, and above all, on the possibility of the state to import basic goods for the Venezuelan people that it, as we already mentioned, include foods, medicine, and supplies for service and health. Also, we have to add that the USA dominates the commercial routes of the main shipping companies, which has allowed, allowed it to hinder the arrival of essential goods for a population. Not only those coming from the US, but from any other supplier country under its fair influence. If we add this to the prohibition or import goods and services directly necessary for the economic activities of our country, including in to industrial inputs and financial services. Those sanctions imposed by the United States have a negative and direct impact on the enjoyment and the full exercise of our human rights. And moreover, uh, they also substantially uh, limit the capacity of the Venezuelan state to comply with, the, with their obligation to guarantee and protect them. The Independent Rapporteur of the United Nations Organization for the Promotion of the International Democratic and Equitable Order, Mr. Uh, Alfred Isaias, after an on-site visit to Venezuela, he says that the causes of the economic and social problems of the country should be analyzed. And he particularly expressed that the sanctions imposed have exacerbated the crisis in Venezuela. The visible hand of the market and the economic war was uh, impacting the quality of life of the people. This special rapporteur presented a report this year after his visit to Venezuela that detailed all the facts and causes of the situation of our country. And he met to, to form his uh, report, he met with representatives of the government, not governmental human rights uh, organizations, civil society organizations, private companies, public and private media, and among others, in which he concluded that among the obstacles for the enjoyment of human rights, he asked about the adverse economic measures about, about adopted by many states and those aim directly and indirectly affecting the proper function of the relevant or the relevant state or limiting its regulatory, regulatory space. For decades, the United Nations has condemned the unilateral coercive measures, especially since uh, the subcommission's important uh, study on the promotion and protection of human rights in 2000 and the year 2000. So, this, there is a worrying campaign to force observers to see a preconceived point of view. For example, the fact that there is an alleged, uh, an alleged humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. So those think it will, we must be cautious, he says, before um, taking into account that humanitarian crisis uh, is a, te a technique terminus and it should be measured as a pretext for military intervention and on a regime change. Also from Suez, we have 
been able to record concrete cases of how the impact of those measures have imposed the Venezuela state and, and the have generation um, a serious violation for the human rights. And I, I know we are finished, almost finishing. So I'm gonna give just one of the examples, but you can find all that in, in, the, in the report made my series. Like in 2017, following the law, uh, the 113, 2017 law, Errol Clear, the bank, he ha they held uh, one, at least one point six hundred fifty thousand dollars that the Venezuelan government had paid for the purchase of food and, Venice and medicines. It was during the same time that the financial blockade was also extended not only to Venezuelan imports, but also to receive payment from services. This meant that the Venezuelan state was also prevented from collecting its profit for economic activities provided to other states. For in this matter, like the Wells Fargo Bank, a private financial entity, they held and canceled the payment of more than uh, $7,500,000 to our country, paid man Brazil for energy sales which made impossible to execute this economic operation, which is something that the Brazil government um, this year recently, they accepted that they have been able to pay us. So these economic sanctions had been that have been imposed had been made impossible to transfer all profits from the United States and have prevented the country from disposing billions of dollars to ensure the human rights and the needs of those who live in our country and that's that's it <laughs> i wish we you get a, were able to get the link to to the full report thank you maria thank you so much so now we'll move into q and now we'll move into q and a um and maria is going to be translating for maria and aura um and so again, to submit your questions, you'll have that icon um, at the bottom of your screen. It says Q and A, you should be able to type your questions to me there. Um, and we'll just go through them and see how many we can get. We only have three right now. So see how many we can get through in the next 20 minutes. Um, and if there's more uh, at time in the end, maybe Sudis can add more examples. Um, I also, I meant to say this at the beginning of the webinar, but this uh, presentation is, is co-sponsored also by the campaign to end the U.S. and uh, Canadian sanctions against Venezuela. Um, this group of organizations and people meet, meets regularly, so if you are um, interested in helping organize in this campaign, there are a variety of working groups that you can join. Um, if you go to afgj.org, on the right side of the screen, you'll see a um, button where you can find out more about that campaign and the email to reach out to, to um, submit your, uh, sorry, to uh, get involved. Um, okay, so let's move into Q&A now. Um, the first one is, what do you feel about today's announcement at the UN by Trump announcing additional sanctions against Venezuela? Hola, buenas noches. Un saludo a todos los compañeros de la solidaridad que desde diferentes latitudes nos acompañan. Expresamos nuestra gratitud y nuestro agradecimiento por la construcción de un mundo donde lo, el respeto a los derechos humanos sea una realidad. And she says hello and thank you to all the solidarity uh, we have received uh, from this space and also to the joint um, human rights uh, organizations around the world and thanks for this opportunity to share with you. No? En relación con la Pregunta vinculada al desempeño del presidente de Estados Unidos en el día de hoy en la Asamblea de Naciones Unidas. Observamos una vez más eh, el comportamiento de agresión, de cerco, de imponer 
este, nuevas sanciones a nuestro país y lo decía nuestro canciller sobre la visión del unilateralismo en la Casa de las Naciones Unidas donde debe imperar el multilateral, multilateralismo. And she says that again, uh, the Trumps, uh, 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 what he said in his speech is like another aggression and another imposition, like, and like our can uh, chancellor said, uh, they're only making uh, possible to find a unilateral world with only one is the one imposing things to another country instead of a place where it should, in the place of multilateralism, where we should be all being having a right to speak up and stand up for themselves, for ourselves. Las sanciones impuestas involucran a la primera dama, que para nosotros es una figura de la primera combatiente del de proceso revolucionario, a nuestro ministro de la defensa, a la vicepresidenta, de la República, al Ministro de Comunicación, este, cargos que son cruciales y que una vez más la práctica demuestra que no es una imposición a la persona, sino que es una sanción unilateral que involucra a un funcionario que ejerce funciones de interés público y de importancia para el país. Um, the thing is uh, the sanctions announced today by the U.S. government, they affect people like our first lady and our vice president and people that they have big and high rank uh, uh, charges in Venezuela. So they're not making these sanctions about one person or what they represent as a person, but what they represent as a country. So they're basically banning and establishing a limit to the government that it will obviously have an impact and how we relate our relationships with the world because if there have been sanctions how can they travel how can they go and and find uh, solutions for a country well uh, thank you the second <laughs> Great. Um, so there are two questions from Gregory. He asks, is there a UN organization people can donate to to avoid the unilateral measures and pass donations on as humanitarian aid to Venezuela? And he also asks uh, about tourism in Venezuela and um, is it safe? Uh, the primera is, I'm translating. Um, si sí, hay una organización a través de las Naciones Unidas donde la gente pueda donar, que pueda, que pueda servir como un puente para eh, evadir las, las medidas coercitivas y pasar esas, don, esas donaciones como una ayuda humanitaria a Venezuela. Y la otra pregunta era que si es eh, seguro para los turistas ah, sí, eh, sí, ir a ahí. visitar a Venezuela sí. y cuáles ciudades recomendarían. Ah, ok. Eh, bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, con respecto al tema de la, de la ayuda humanitaria, nosotros, eh, o sea, es difícil eh, la situación en el país. Efectivamente hay una crisis económica derivada directamente de la aplicación de las medidas coercitivas. ¿no? Pero nuestro discurso ha estado fundamentalmente dirigido a que la ayuda, la solidaridad internacional tiene que dirigirse fundamentalmente a solicitar ante las distintas instancias el cese de las medidas coercitivas para el Estado venezolano. Okay. Uh, María dice que en regards to humanitarian aid, uh, we are uh, We know that there is an economic crisis and we have known the difficulties that we have, we have as a country. But we believe that the, many, that the health and the solidarity of the countries and these people should be directed um, to ask uh, the stop and the end of these sanctions. So instead of getting humanitarian aid, we are actually able to function as a country 
and to be able to get the goods ourselves because the money is there and the willing to use the money for goods and medicine is already there. The government is already finding ways with other countries to avoid those things. But um, I don't think right now there is a there is a way to avoid the sanctions through either an organization or through United Nations. I think that the call is to ask uh, their international um, the international community to and denounce the fact that we have been facing this blockade. So to end to uh, ask for the stop for these uh, sanctions so we can continue and start working again as, as a regular country. And regarding the other question. Y con respecto a la, a la segunda pregunta, con el tema de la inseguridad, eh, efectivamente hay países en Latinoamérica que son, digamos, de acuerdo a la, las tasas delictivas más seguros que otros. En el caso de Venezuela se ha venido haciendo un esfuerzo importante por el tema de la seguridad y se han dirigido políticas públicas para mejorar el nivel de seguridad en la población, ¿no? Y en cuanto a las ciudades, bueno, hay muchos lugares en Venezuela que además de ser seguros son bonitos y, digamos, nuestra organización como organizaciones aliadas y otras organizaciones que tienen que ver con el turismo están realizando trabajos con otras organizaciones y haciendo visitas de turismo solidario para conocer el país y conocer otra realidad de la que los medios de comunicación quieren mostrar sobre un país que está sumido en la violencia, en el caos, cuando en la realidad no es así. She says that. Toro. <laughs> ah, uh, she says that one of the one of the reasons she understands that in some places of Latin America are safer than others, and we also understand how Venezuela has been paid in of, of this place filled with insecurity, and but be, beyond that, there have been also been efforts um, to secure and political uh, policies to ensure the safety, especially of those places um, that we normally see as beaches, uh, more, more f uh, famous places. Um, she also wants to highlight that social organizations are also working to secure and create, uh, especially in this economic crisis, they have found other ways, uh, not only to protect their places, but to promote tourism. So we invite you to, um, if you're going to come, any place, uh, you, I think you will be able to find an organization and a group of people willing to uh, give you the best experience ever. What's the answer? Thank you. Um, let's see, what reaction do you have to mainstream media about the references to Maduro as a dictator and the failure of the Venezuelan state? Okay. Okay. Sí, ciertamente es la matriz de opinión de las corporaciones eh, internacionales de la información, los mercantilistas de la información, los carteles de la información que han hecho esfuerzos durante años para posicionar esa matriz en, la, en los pueblos. Muchos al llegar a Venezuela este, observan completamente un país con sus debilidades, pero que funciona, que opera, que vive, que sufre, que llora, que goza de un sistema electoral transparente, de una democracia fortalecida y de un poder popular pujante, participante y activo en todos los procesos del país. Okay. Uh, she says that she's highly aware of how the uh, mainstream media has portrayed not only President Maduro, but the country 
and its institutions because it's not a work that is started with Maduro. It started from way, way back. In, they have been um, working on it in so many aspects and so many years. So she says that beyond the difficulties that we have been facing as a country, um, we still have our institutions and we still, they still work and we still live and, and, and work through them. And it has been the popular, um, the popular groups and the po popular power, the one that has ensured uh, the continuity of policies and has been the ones who carry the country out. So that's uh, our answer to all that mainstream media says, because when people come here, they find a completely different reality. Because that what is being sold is not especially the reality of the people working every day and what they're doing and, and showing. Yes. Okay, the next question is how successful has Venezuela been in finding alternative sources for imports of food and medicines to replace U.S., Canadian, and European products? Uh, well, I have at the top of my head one of the first uh, examples that come to my mind, especially in the medicine field. It has been to uh, increase uh, the relationships with other countries, such as India, that they have a very, uh, and also China, who have a more developed industrial system, and especially in the pharmacy field, that have been able to provide either uh, aid and, and also we have been trying to get a, uh, people to study and, and get there to prepare so we can have and build here our own uh, industrial, um, to increase on industrial uh, apartment, which we uh, know that is still very, um, very small compared, thanks because we used to import a lot of goods from other countries. So, también ahí es importante eh, decirles que eh, se ha hecho triangulaciones con algunos países, pero que eso ha representado un gasto adicional para el Estado mucho más costoso para poder adquirir sus medicamentos, dado que si las empresas contrataban con Venezuela iban a ser sancionadas. Yeah, she also remarks a very important thing that is that sometimes in order to get those medicines and get those goods instead of doing a direct, um, a direct relation when in a specific country, we do it through other countries so they don't get sanctioned. And, but at the same time, this experience has proved that it's very expensive because they, we can get those goods directly and in a short amount of time because they have to go through all a third country before they get here. So a related question to that um, is uh, about China. Um, how else, in addition to what you already mentioned, is China showing support for Venezuela sovereignty? Ay, el apoyo que, que dice que en relación a eso está esta pregunta uh -huh. que dice que, que estaba feliz de ver eh, que China envió uh -huh. un, un hospital, sí, claro. un buque de hospital, uh -huh. que entonces para hablar un poco también de, de cómo países como China nos han brindado ayuda. Sí, eh, se ha desarrollado todo un vínculo eh, de apoyo con Venezuela y China, que recientemente con la gira de nuestro presidente a China hubo la posibilidad de firmar 28 acuerdos en diferentes áreas. Y una de ellas, y se concreta en la presencia en aguas venezolanas de este hospital de ayuda humanitaria que tiene más de 500 eh, camas y donde se pueden ejecutar más de 35 operaciones de manera simultánea, eh, donde la donación de medicamentos es un hecho y que ya desde hace tres días nuestra población está gozando de ello en el litoral. Um, she says that um, in regards to China, um, that comes uh, 
as a result of the reason for that our president gave to China, where at least um, 28 agreements were signed. And this hospital ship has been uh, in Venezuela for three days now. And it also not only provides um, medical help, but it, it also has provided medicine, to the, especially to those in need. So we are very thankful for that. And we, we hope these kind of uh, agreements with other countries keep increasing. Thank you. Um, next question is uh, from Alison Bodine. She says, this is in the chat window, so um, I'm not sure if everyone can see this. Um, thank you very much for your great presentation. Very important for our campaign against sanctions and threats against Venezuela. Can you please address the psychological and social impacts that sanctions and military threats against Venezuela have on the people of Venezuela? She's gonna to give uh, one example and especially in what happens to women. But I wanted to share uh, an special, an special, no, an specific example of how these sanctions have affected regular people. Because sometimes we see the sanctions, uh, we see that the sanctions have been applied to people from the government, and we don't see how it truly impacts um, the people. But it really does. And one of those examples would be I, uh, an author that has his book published in the Amazon platform. And he was told by the Amazon company that he couldn't receive the earnings from the sellings of his book, of his digital book, due to the sanctions of, that have been imposed on the American territory. So since Amazon is an American company, they decided that they won't be paying him his earnings, and that's a completely direct effect. So can you imagine like you have your work published and you have your bank account because even his bank account was shut down and he has no relation to the government. He's just an author who, can, who can't charge uh, his earnings. And I think of many examples that go, especially by the internet, like people, especially young people who can't go and do normal things like buying stuff and because of these sanctions and this blockade. For example, in the case of women, the time that women have to be able to look for alimentos, for to look for medicine, por este bloqueo económico, genera que ellas, por ejemplo, no puedan hacer sus actividades normal de participación política y social, la que están normalmente acostumbradas en un país donde la participación de la mujer en la actividad política y en la actividad social ha crecido en los últimos 20 años de manera exponencial. Ok, she says that in the case of women in Venezuela where political participation has been increased, in, in these last 10 years, uh, the impact of these sanctions goes because women now have to spend way more time finding uh, goods and foods and specific medicines that they won't be able to find in their regular pharmacy or their regular uh, store. And so the time they spend uh, looking for those products are basically the time the time they use for political participation and the participation in the community, it decreases because they are long, they are working to get their food and work them, to get their medicine for their children and their families and for their friends. And they're no longer able to participate or dedicate more time to themselves. <laughs> Thank you. So, 
Um, it's the top of the hour right now. We usually try to end right away, but I have uh, one more question that I think would be really good to close this out. Um, and from Carol, and she asked, how can we best show solidarity with the social movements in Venezuela from here in the US? And I'll add Canada as well, because we have a lot of people who participate on these calls from Canada. ¿Qué, cómo, qué, cómo vale, vale. pueden hacer, sí, para, para la solidaridad, de, sobre todo en vale. Estados Unidos y Canadá? Um, creo que importante es dar a conocer esta visión, eh, planificar visitas donde las organizaciones sociales venezolanas estamos dispuestas a recibirlos, a llevarlos a espacios donde nuestro poder popular actúa, participa y vive, y este, a, abrir todos aquellos medios alternativos posibles para dar a conocer esta realidad que las corporaciones de la comunicación que mercantilizan, pues no lo han hecho. Creo que es lo principal en solidaridad. Sí. 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 Sí and sharing reports and investigations that many people are doing. They may not be on the mainstream media, but exists. Um, it also, it will be really good to schedule visits here where organizations and all those social organizations, we can uh, accompany them and take them to see the reality of what's happening in Venezuela so they can take it to another spaces. But, and also, um, try to uh, break the media um, breach and, and try to share as much as possible what is their original views, what is really happening, and also denouncing this kind of blockades and, and these threats that we receive every day. And especially on social media, when we, what we see is what they're being told by the mainstream media. So, Every, every opinion counts, and we, we hope that you'll be able to share not only reports that we're making in the human rights field, but also what the other people are doing. Yeah, I don't know if, how we can do it to like give the link to our page, web page, and the email. Yeah, so um, there were a few questions about how can we find your report. Um, we will send the link to the report out um, with the recording of this webinar tomorrow. And so you can read the whole thing for yourselves. Um, Sures' contact information will be in there. So I didn't get to everybody's question today. Thank you for all of the excellent questions that folks submitted. Um, so maybe you can ask their questions directly to them. Um, and if they're available, they can get back to you. Um, I just wanted to send us a special thank you to Sures, your work, um, and to Aura, Maria, y la otra Maria for translating for us. Um, you're an excellent translator. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> and then I just also wanted to remind folks about um, to join, if you're interested to join the anti-sanctions campaign, um, we, uh, there's more information about it at afgj.org. Um, you'll see information about the anti-sanctions campaign, how to get involved. We have a call to action that you can sign and share. Um, so with that, I'll close us out and thank you again. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.